Hi everybody and welcome to this video about carbon accounting guidelines for beginners. In this video, I will explain some key carbon accounting principles, principles which should help and guide humanitarian organizations that are doing carbon accounting for the first time. The principles in this video are organized around three themes, scope, data quality, and baseline and target setting. So on the screen here, you see an overview of all the guidelines, all the principles across our three themes. So let me quickly read this through. When starting, keep your scope limited. Be transparent about your scope. Learn from experience and enlarge your scope over time. So these three guidelines belong to the team scope. Then we have assess the quality of the data you collect. When unsure, assume the worst alternative. The big picture matters more than the details. And current accounting is a learning process. So these four guidelines belong to the team data quality. And then we have a target requires a specific scope and baseline and compare apples with apples. So these two last guidelines belong to the team baseline and target setting. What you also see here on the screen is when in the video we start talking about each of these nine guidelines. We added this here in case you want to jump directly to one specific guideline in the video. So let's start with the guidelines belonging to the team scope. Our first guideline is the following. When starting, keep your scope limited. So in other words, when you're doing the first rounds of current accounting for your organization, keep the scope limited and feasible. Don't try to cover everything at first, else you might get lost in the process. Instead, focus on a certain scope, learn from experience, and then enlarge your scope. So what exactly does the scope mean in the context of carbon accounting? Well, there are two main um, scope dimensions. The first one is the organizational scope. So each organization has its own organizational structure with different entities. For example, organization ABC has one headquarter, two regional offices, and 12 country offices, so a total of 15 entities. Imagine organization ABC is doing its first round of uh, carbon accounting, and for that reason, because it is its first time, because it still has a lot to experience and to learn, it decides to limit the organizational scope of its carbon reports, of its first carbon report, to just a few uh, entities namely its headquarters, one regional office, and three country offices, so a total of uh, five entities. Organization ABC is just basically piloting carbon accounting with these five entities, making sure it can build solid carbon accounting processes before then extending its scope to the entire organization. Let's look at another example. Organization XYZ has one headquarter, three regional offices and 18 country offices, so a total of 22 entities. Imagine this organization has already gone through multiple cycles of carbon accounting. It's mature on a carbon accounting scale, especially so in comparison with organization ABC. And because it's mature, because it has solid carbon accounting processes in place, it's doing carbon accounting for all its 22 entities. So for the entire organization. And covering the entire organization should, of course, always be the uh, end objective. So organizational scope was the first dimension of scope. The second dimension is the emissions uh, scope. You're probably familiar with the picture here on the screen. It shows the three different scopes of carbon emissions according to the GG protocol. So you should always report scope one and scope two emissions. Uh, this is mandatory, again, according to the GG protocol. It is not mandatory, however, to report scope three emissions. So it is up to you to decide which of the 15 scope three categories you should report. Uh, 
Our first guideline is to keep your scope limited when you're doing your first rounds of carbon accounting. So obviously, because it's mandatory, you should always report scope one and scope two emissions. But when it comes to scope three emissions, there you'll have to make a decision because scope three emissions are optional. Um, we do, however, highly encourage you to report scope three emissions because these um, typically sum up to significant volumes. And so most emissions in the humanitarian sector are um, actually scope three emissions. And, and this is the case for the humanitarian sector, but um, also for other sectors. So we highly encourage you to report scope three emissions for that reason, uh, but also because of the, the do no harm principles that's very specific to the humanitarian sector. But still, if you're just starting with carbon accounting, you might want to look at just a few of uh, scope three categories like uh, business travel and the purchasing of goods and services. On top of the picture, you see different greenhouse gases illustrated in the clouds. These are all the greenhouse gases that must be considered following the GG protocol in all three scopes. So there is carbon dioxide, the most famous one, but also methane, nitrous oxides, and others. So we have six in total. The good news is that when preparing your carbon reports, so when doing carbon accounting, you will work with emissions factors that aggregate all those different greenhouse gases at CO2 equivalent level. So you don't have to worry about the different greenhouse gases. Let's again look at a couple of examples. Remember organization ABC. Um, so we said organization ABC was just starting with carbon accounting. It's just starting, so it decides to only look at a few categories of scope 3 emissions, namely category 1, 2, and 5. Um, it decides so because uh, these categories are perceived as important uh, by the organization in terms of emissions volumes and because data is relatively easy to collect for these categories. Then we have organization XYZ, uh, which has been uh, doing carbon accounting for many years. And so organization XYZ uh, decides to report all scope three categories, uh, maybe excluding one or two uh, that are simply not relevant for the organization. There are a few ways the tool can help you with this first guideline. So first, when it comes to the emission scope specifically, the tool uh, can help you prioritize the different emissions categories. So you know that scope one and scope two are mandatory, so there is no questioning there. But for scope three, it can help you set uh, your priorities. So um, you'll find in the tool something called priority score. And this priority score uh, basically defines uh, the priority on a scale of one to three of the different emissions categories. So this priority score was defined when the tool got developed with the input of different humanitarian organizations, as well as inputs from uh, carbon accounting experts. So I'll first explain how this um, priority score works in theory with the help of one slide, and then I'll show it in the tool. As I mentioned, the priority score ranges from one to three. The scores were defined based on two criteria. First, how important is the emissions category in terms of uh, volume in the humanitarian sector? And second, would humanitarian organizations have leverage to reduce emissions in this category? So if the emissions category is perceived as important in the humanitarian sector, and if there is um, leverage for reduction, then the priority score was set to one, and um, if not, then the score was set to 2 or 3. So emissions categories with a priority score of 1 are of high importance, and you should definitely report these. Emissions categories with a priority score of 2 are of medium importance. Um, so we highly encourage you to report these, um, but it should not be your toughest priority, especially if you're just starting with carbon accounting. And emissions categories with a priority score of 3 are of lower importance. And if you're just um, starting with carbon accounting, then you should really feel comfortable fully ignoring these um, categories. Let me now show you how this priority score looks like in the humanitarian carbon calculator tool.
So for each of the different input tabs, you have a first column here that shows the priority score of each emissions category. So for example, here I'm in the energy tab and for the emissions category stationary combustion, the priority score is one because stationary combustion is scope one. So it's mandatory to report this category. Let's look at another example. So I'm now in the travel step. And in this step, we have the emissions categories, business travels and employee commuting. And these both have a priority score of one. But then we also have an emissions category for volunteers. And this has a priority score of two because volunteers may not be as important in terms of uh, volumes. And this also depends from one organization to another, but it may not be as important as employees. In the overview tab, you can find an overview of the different emissions categories across the different tabs. And then you also have an overview of their priority scores. I also wanted to reflect on these applicable fields here. With this applicable field, you can mention which of the different emissions lines are applicable, so are relevant or not to your organization. So for example, imagine your organization does not control or own any vehicles. So in other words, it doesn't have a fleet. Then this mobile combustion emissions category is irrelevant to your organization because mobile combustion should reflect emissions resulting from the use of the reporting organization's own fleet. So with this in mind, you can then set the applicable fields to no and you can easily drag this down. And you notice then that all the lines then get grayed out. So you don't have to worry about this anymore. So this functionality is also useful for scope management. Another way the tool can help you with this first guideline is through the completeness score. The completeness score indicates how complete or not your carbon accounting data is. So again, let me first explain this further in theory with the help of a couple of slides, and then I'll show how it works in the tool. The completeness score ranges between 0% and 100%. 0% is bad. It means you're not entering carbon accounting data, not for any of the entities that you listed in the tool. And 100% is good. It means you're providing data for all of the entities that you listed in the tool. The completeness score gets automatically calculated and it gets calculated at different levels, meaning it gets calculated for the entire carbon report, for each emissions category separately, and also for each emissions subcategory separately. So how is the completeness score calculated? Well, it depends on the entities that you listed in the tool, their size, and the data that you're entering. Imagine you have three entities and you enter full data for all these three entities, then your completeness score will be 100%. And it doesn't matter if you enter data separately for each entity or for all entities at once, so meaning at global level, in both cases, the completeness score will be 100%. If you do not enter any data for any of the entities, then obviously your completeness score will be 0%. And if you do enter data for just a few entities, then the completeness score will get calculated, taking into consideration the size of each entity. And the size of each entity is defined based on the allocation type. And I'll give some extra explanation about this allocation type in the next slide, and then we'll have a look in the tool. So in order to explain how the allocation type works, I'll use some examples. Imagine your organization has three entities and you listed all those three entities in the tool. So you're doing carbon accounting for the three entities. You have country office one, 
Country Office 2 and Country Office 3. Country Office 1 has a budget of 1000 US dollars, so does Country Office 3, and Country Office 2 only has half of it, meaning 500 US dollars. Now let's look at example 1 on the slides. In example 1, you are entering data for Country Office 1, but you don't have any data for Country Office 2 and Country Office 3, so you're not entering data for these two entities. Considering the allocation type is set to budget, then your completeness score will be 40%, because you only have data for Country Office 1, and the budget of Country Office 1 represents 40% of the total budget of the three entities. So at thousands out of 2,500 US dollars, this is 40%. Let's look at example two. In example two, you enter data for country office one and country office three. Country office one and country office three both have a budget of 1,000 US dollars each, and together this sums up to 80% of the total budget considering the three entities. So your completeness score will be 80%. And let's look at our last example, example three. In this example, you only enter data for country office two. A country office two budget weights only 20% of the total budget. It's a smaller entity compared to country office one and country office three. And thus the completeness score will be set to 20% in this example. So in the examples we've just been through, the allocation type was budget meaning budget was used to reflect the size of each entity and then compute the completeness score. But in fact, you can set the allocation type to a few other figures. You can set it to the number of FT internally, so the number of employees per entity. You can set it to the number of FT externally, so the number of volunteers per entity. You can set it to the total number of FT, so including both employees and volunteers. You can set it to the number of square meters, so the total office size per entity, or you can also define another figure which is relevant to your organization. So basically define your own allocation type. So let's now have a look in the tool and I'll start by going through the, the first step, the general information tab, uh, because the information that you'll have to type in there is relevant for the completeness score calculation. So let's again assume we have one organization that has three entities, country office one, country office two, and country office three, and I want to do carbon accounting for these three entities. So I'm going to type here three, so my number of entities for which I want to do carbon accounting is three, and then I will enter here the ID of each entity. So I type country office one and then two and three. If I only wanted to do carbon accounting for two of these entities, then I would have mentioned here two and I would have only typed the two entities uh, that are in my um, scope. Next, I have to enter data for each of these entities. So I'll first have to enter how many internal FT, so how many employees, so I'll do that. Then I have to enter how many external FTs, so those are the volunteers. I have to enter the surface for each of these entities, so the, the number of square meters the, in, of the offices of these entities. And then lastly, I have to enter the budget for these three entities. And here I'll take the same numbers as the example we had in the slide just a couple of minutes ago. So meaning a thousand for entity one, 500 for entity two, and a thousand again for entity three. And then if you scroll down and you click on this plus button, then you will see here the um, the different allocation types and their rates being calculated based on what the data that you provided here. And you also have here this extra line called other, so that's the sixth allocation type that you can use. So you can basically type in any allocation type in there, but of course it has to sum up to 100%. So let me do that. 
Voilà. So you don't have to do that, of course. It's just if you want to have an allocation type based on something else that than the five options that you have here. So let me now go to the energy tab and let's assume I have to enter some data for mobile combustion. So for the transportation emissions coming from my own fleet. And let's assume I know how much petrol the fleet consumed for the three country offices. So let's assume country office one consumed 100 liters, country office two consumed 200 liters, and country office three, three consumed 300 liters. Okay, so I have data for all three entities, I have full coverage, so my completeness score is 100%. Imagine I didn't have data for country office 3, nor did I have data for country office 2, so I only have data for country office 1. Then the completeness score is set to 40%. Why 40%? Because my allocation type is budget, and if you remember, the budget of country office 1 is 1,000, and the total budget of the three country offices is 2,500. So 1,000 out of 2,500, that's 40%. And so I only have data for these country offices, uh, country office one that represents 40% of the budget. So my completeness score is set to 40%. You have different options for the allocation type. So you can um, use all alternatives that you have here. Just keep in mind that whatever is defaulted here is something that generally makes sense, but you're always free to uh, to change it as it's more suitable to your organization. Now let's imagine I don't have data for any of my entities. I don't know how much petrol the fleets of those three entities consumed. Then I would have a completeness score of 0%. And let's imagine I have data for all three entities, but I don't know the exact split for the three entities. I don't know. I only know the data at a uh, global level, so the, the total. And in total, I know that the three entities together consumed, let's say, 300 liters of petrol. And then again, my completeness score will be 100% because I have full coverage. Now, as you've seen, the completeness score is calculated for each line separately, but you can also go to the results tab and here you will see the completeness score for each of the emissions categories. Um, so in our case, we have 17% for direct emissions from mobile combustion sources, because I only entered data for petrol. So that's why I don't have 100% here. And I also have the completeness score considering the full carbon report, which is in this example only 2%. So I have lots of data to, um, to enter. I would like to show one last thing here. If you scroll down, you will see the results by each entity. So you will see the carbon footprint of each entity separately. So we have country office one, two and three, and you have the results below. So for the direct emissions from mobile combustion, you have the numbers here. But remember, we actually entered the data at global level rather than for each entity separately. So how can we come to those uh, numbers then? Well, again, it gets calculated with help of the allocation types. So the um, emissions in total are 0 0.69. Sorry, it's actually written here, 0 0.69. And so 40% of it will go to country office 1, 40% to country office 3, and 20% to country office 2. Because country office 1 has a budget that represents 40% of the total budget, so does country office 3, and then country office 2 only has um, a budget that weights 20%. All right, so we've been through the first guideline. Let's now have a look at the second one.
The second guideline is the following. Be transparent about your scope. So it's clear, especially when you just got started, that your carbon reports will not cover 100% of uh, the carbon emissions resulting either directly or indirectly from your organization. And that is okay. However, when you share your carbon reports, or if you share some aggregated uh, numbers, either internally or externally, be sure to always mention your scope. So if, um, for example, you calculated a total carbon footprint for last year of 100 tons of CO2 equivalents, which emissions categories do you include uh, in there? And I'm thinking here specifically about scope 3 emissions, because scope 3 emissions, as we've seen, um, are not mandatory. Um, so be specific about which category you included and which category you did not um, include. There are many organizations that report net zero, but that do not report scope 3 emissions. So this gives not necessarily a wrong uh, picture, but certainly an incomplete uh, picture, and it can be misleading. Moving on to the third guideline, and this one I've mostly explained already. The guideline is the following, learn from experience and enlarge your scope over time. So the three guidelines that we've seen um, and that you see here on, on the screen, they go together. So start with a small scope, be transparent about that scope, learn from experience, enlarge your scope and continue to be transparent about um, the scope. Let's now move on to our second group of guidelines, uh, which is around the theme of data quality. Our first guideline about data quality is the following. Assess the quality of the data that you collect. So you'll collect a lot of data to feed your carbon reports. Uh, carbon accounting is a very data intensive exercise. And the data that you'll collect will vary in terms of quality. Some data is relatively easy to collect and will be of topest quality. Some data is much more difficult to collect. Uh, in fact, you'll need to work with some estimates and so the quality might not be that um, great. And that is okay, it's inevitable. Um, again, especially if you just uh, got started, but be sure to understand um, the quality of the data that you collect and to keep track of it. As you come up with your total uh, carbon footprint, um, it's important for you to understand how accurate or less accurate your numbers are. Um, and also over time, the quality of your data may improve as you set in place certain process to reach better quality. So it's also important to keep track of um, the quality over time. So the good news is that the tool can help you in assessing and tracking the quality of uh, the data that you enter. So it does so with the quality score. So the quality score defines how accurate or not um, calculated emissions are. Uh, this metric goes very well together with the completeness score. So remember the completeness score um, explains how complete uh, your data is and then the uh, quality score um, explains how accurate. Um, the, um, the carbon reports uh, are. So I'll explain how the quality score works uh, in theory, again with the help of a few slides, and then I'll show how it works in the tool. The quality score is automatically calculated per emissions category and for the entire carbon reports. So in fact, for each emissions category and for the entire carbon report, you can see both the quality score and the completeness score. The quality score is a function of the quality of the data that you enter and of the certainty level of the emissions factors that you use. So in other words, the quality score depends on how accurate the activity data that you enter is and how accurate the emissions factors that you rely on are. The data certainty indicator defines how accurate the activity data that you enter is and the emissions factor uncertainty indicator defines how accurate each emissions factor is. Let me further explain these two indicators. Starting with the data certainty indicator. So the data certainty indicator needs to be entered manually in the tool together with the activity data, so together with your input data. 
The data certainty indicator can take four different values, 100%, 75%, 50%, and 25%. So when you enter some data in the humanitarian carbon calculator tool, you have to choose whether the data deserves a data certainty indicator of 100%, 75%, 50%, or 25%. What does it mean to set the data certainty indicator to 100%? So when should you set the data certainty indicator to 100%? Well, you should do so when the data that you enter is both reliable and precise. For example, to know the diesel consumption from your fleet, you can get the exact volume of diesel consumed in liters from the fuel station receipts. The numbers on the receipts are fully reliable and precise, so they deserve a data certainty of 100%. When should you set the data certainty indicator to 75%? Well, you should do so when the data that you enter got calculated based on reliable assumptions or extrapolations. For example, imagine you want to calculate energy consumption for one of your country offices. You received the electricity bills for 10 out of the 12 months for which you want to report carbon emissions. So you're missing two months. Let's imagine you haven't received the remaining electricity bills for these two months yet, so you're still waiting for them. So what can you do here? Uh, well, you can calculate a monthly average energy consumption from the 10 months for which you have the data, and then multiply this by two for the two months for which you don't have the data. So you basically extrapolate the energy consumption for the two missing months from the 10 months. In this example, we assume that the numbers on the electricity bills are reliable and precise. That might not be the case everywhere in the world, but in this example, we assume they are. And so the data certainty indicator can be set to 75%. When should you set the data certainty indicator to 50%? Well, you should do so when the data that you enter got calculated based on somewhat less reliable assumptions or extrapolations. Let's take the example of waste. Let's imagine you measured the waste volumes at one specific office for one week. And you use that data to calculate the yearly volumes of waste for that office. So if you look at our example, 17 kilograms of office waste were measured for one specific week at the given office and then you multiply that with 52 and you get a total yearly volume of office waste estimated at 884 kilograms. This deserves a data certainty indicator of 50% because you only have office waste data for one specific week and you basically assume all weeks are the same and which especially in a small office might not be true. You might need more than one week of data to come up with a representative average number. And lastly, when should you set the data certainty indicator to 25%? So this is the worst possible option. You should do so when the data that you enter got estimated from public numbers or national studies. Let's stick with the example of waste. Imagine you want to calculate the yearly waste volume at one specific office located in Kenya. And in Kenya, the average office waste volume per person per year is, according to studies, equal to 7 kilograms. So you find this number in a study, you take this number and multiply it with the number of employees in the office, so 76, and so you estimate that the yearly waste volume at that office is 532 kilograms. So, in short, as a recap, we have a data certainty indicator that can take four different values, 100%, 75%, 50%, and 25%. Whenever you enter input data, you should always assess the quality of the data that you enter, and based on your assessment and the explanations we just went through, set the data certainty indicator to either 175, 50, or 25%. And be honest here, uh, you might find it painful to set the data certainty indicator to 25%, but remember that current accounting is no competition, so if your data deserves 
then you should select 25% indeed. And in the next um, carbon accounting exercise, aim to improve the quality of the data that you enter. So let's look at a quick example in the tool. Let's imagine I am currently entering the data for mobile combustion and I'm entering the data for the volumes of petrol consumed by my, um, my fleet, by the, the fleet of my organization. And I got that data from the fuel station receipts, which the fleet manager handed over to me. So this source is both reliable and precise. And so what it means is that after entering the data here, I can then adjust the certainty indicator to 100%. So notice that the certainty indicator always gets defaulted to 25%. So this is the worst option. And so don't forget, whenever you enter data, to update it to its right um, value. So remember, the quality score depends on the data certainty indicator and the emissions factor and certainty indicator. So what is the emissions factor and certainty indicator? How does it work? So the emissions factor uncertainty defines how certain or not an emission factor is. So it is part of the emissions factor definition. It is tied uh, to the emissions factor. The emissions factor uncertainty is a number that ranges from 0% to 100%. So an emissions factor that has an uncertainty of 0% is an excellent emission factor. It means it has basically no uncertainty attached to it. Um, so it's probably a very specific and precise emission factor. Uh, maybe, for example, one that you got from, um, from your supplier, directly from your supplier. On the contrary, an emission factor that has an uncertainty close to 100% is highly uncertain. Um, so probably a very um, aggregated, um, unspecific and precise uh, emission factor. So most emissions factor will have an uncertainty level between um, zero and 100%, which are um, extreme uh, numbers. So unlike the, the quality index, which you have to ha enter as you enter the um, emissions uh, input data, the emissions factor uncertainty is already um, attached to the emissions factor, so you don't have to enter it again as you enter uh, the data. Let's take some examples to further illustrate the concept of emissions factors. So emissions volume are calculated based on the multiplication of activity data with emissions factors corresponding to the activity data. And in the example that you see here, we are looking at energy consumption. So we consumed 100 kilowatt hours over the reporting period, and we have an emissions factor of 0.5 kilogram CO2 equivalent per kilowatt hour. And thus, our emissions volume for energy consumption is estimated at 50 kilogram of CO2 equivalent. This is a number that will be used in the carbon report. That's what you will see in the results tab of the humanitarian carbon calculator tool. But in fact, that number might be more or less accurate depending on the emissions factor accuracy, which is reflected by this emissions factor uncertainty indicator. So if the emissions factor has an uncertainty of 0%, so the emissions factor uncertainty is set to 0%, it means it is fully accurate and use the calculated emissions in our example 50 kilogram of CO2 equivalent very well reflect reality, a fully reflect reality in fact. What if the emissions factor has an uncertainty rate of 50%? What does this mean? Well, it means that the calculated emissions volume, so 50 kilogram of CO2 equivalent, this is probably not super accurate. In fact, the emissions volume resulting from the energy consumption of our example might not be 50, but it should be a number in between 25 and 75. 
25 is indeed 50% of 50 and 75 is 150% of 50. So we're looking at 50 minus 50% or plus 50%. What if the emissions factor has an uncertainty rate of 100%? Well, it means that the calculated emissions volume are even more inaccurate than in our previous example. The emissions volume resulting from the energy consumption in our example might not be 50, but it should be a number in between 0 and 100. So 0 and 100 kilogram of CO2 equivalent. 0 is indeed 0% of 50, so uh, 50 minus 100% and 100 is 200% of 50, so 50 plus 100%. But remember, in all three scenarios, in all three examples that we just saw, emissions will still be calculated in the tool as 50 kg of CO2 equivalent. Let's look back at our example of petrol in the humanitarian carbon calculator tool. So here you have the value of the emissions factor and if you click on the plus button, you also see the uncertainty of the emissions factor, which is 5%. And this is a pretty low uh, uncertainty, so that is, that is good. So we entered a thousand of liters of petrol and this is then converted with the emissions factor to a total volume of carbon emissions equal to 2,900 uh, kilograms of CO2 equivalent. And then next to this, we see that the uncertainty volume is at roughly 150 uh, kilograms of CO2 equivalent. And this is 5% of the 2,900. So this means that the volume of emissions resulting from these thousands of liters of petrol consumed is somewhere between 2,900 minus 150, so 2,750, and 2,900 plus 150, so 3,050. So yeah, the emissions volume is somewhere across this range, but what will be reported in the tool and in the results tab is the 2,900. So I'm now in the results tab, and what I see here is the quality score for the emissions category direct emissions from mobile combustion sources, and it's equal to 95%, so this is really good, and it's calculated based on the emissions factor uncertainty and based on the, the data certainty. So it's 95%, but we also see that the completeness score is only 17%. Uh, we entered very little data, so it's good quality, but you know, um, not very comprehensive uh, data. And then if we look here, we also see the quality score as calculated for the full carbon reports. And then again, we also see the completeness score for the full reports. The second guideline with regards to data quality is the following. When unsure, assume the worst alternative. So when you're doubting about the data to enter, go for the worst available data option. So let's take one example and I'll illustrate this with one slide. Imagine your organization is operating in Nepal. So you have an office there which consumes electricity from the grid and you need to report the emissions of this. However, the problem is that in the humanitarian carbon calculator tool, we don't have an emissions factor for electricity from the grid in Nepal. And you cannot find anything online. So what should you do? Well, in this case, you could look for emissions factors of similar countries in the region. 
and take the worst emissions factor and use that for Nepal. So you basically assume the worst alternative for Nepal. The third guideline with regards to data quality is the following. The big picture matters more than the details. As I've already mentioned, carbon accounting is a very data intensive exercise, and it might be really difficult to collect or estimate some of the data, or you might easily get lost in some details. Our advice here is to not spend too much time on data that is not super important in terms of emissions volume. Uh, on the contrary, make sure to focus and be very rigorous on these emissions uh, sources that are the most important. Uh, so let me illustrate this with one example again. Transportation of humanitarian supplies is for many humanitarian organizations an important source of emissions. So roads, sea, air transports, this all sums up to a significant volume of emissions. So then it's important to spend time collecting transport data of good quality using reliable and precise emissions factors and making sure overall that emissions are rightly calculated with a good level of accuracy. On the other hand, imagine your organization works with a small number of volunteers, then it might not be worth spending too much time on calculating emissions resulting from volunteers commuting or traveling, because these would not sum up uh, to a big volume. Now, of course, when your organization is doing carbon accounting for the first time, it would not know the volumes of each emissions category, but there are some extreme cases, like in our example, where you can have a good a priori sense. The fourth guideline with regards to data quality is the following. Carbon accounting is a learning process. So when you just got started with carbon accounting for your organization, the data quality might not be the best. You might miss some data as well. Uh, you might not have the most complete data sets. But the good news, as I just said, is that carbon accounting is a learning process and you will learn and improve as you go through different carbon accounting cycles. You will set up some more solid data collection and data processing processes and the quality and completeness of your data will improve over time. So don't be too nervous when you just start. If things are not perfect, they probably won't be. And instead, focus on continuous improvements. Let's now move on to our third and last group of guidelines, uh, which is around the theme of uh, baseline and target setting. Our first guideline about baseline and target setting is the following. A target, so a carbon reduction target, requires a specific scope and baseline. When you set a target for your organization, you need to be specific about the scope of the target. So is the target applicable for the full carbon footprint of your organization, including scope three, or is it only applicable for scope one and or scope two? Or maybe you're setting up some target for a specific emissions category, like for example, you're setting a target to reduce emissions resulting from the purchasing of humanitarian supplies or emissions resulting from the transportation of these humanitarian supplies. So a target always goes hand in hand with a given scope, but before even setting the target, you need to have a proper baseline against which you can measure your progress in emissions reduction and evaluate whether you're on the right path to meet your targets. The baseline needs to be specific as well with regards to its scope, but it also needs an appropriate level of quality and completeness. The next guideline is also the last one, and it's the following, compare apples with apples. So this one is pretty obvious and very much related to guideline eight. The scope of your target should be similar to the scope of your baseline, and you should measure progress with the same scope as well. Additionally, the same measurement methodologies should also be used across the baseline targets and the progress throughout to allow for correct comparisons. If your methodologies are changing, you should apply the new methodologies back to the baseline 
and to avoid making these changes against past data, best uh, would be to fix the baseline once you've reached a certain level of maturity and stability with regards to carbon accounting and uh, measurement methodologies. So we've been through all of the guidelines that we had planned for this video. And on the screen here, you see an overview of all of these guidelines. So let me read this through. So with regards to scope, we have three guidelines. When starting, keep your scope limited, be transparent about your scope, learn from experience and enlarge your scope over time. With regards to data quality, we have four guidelines. Assess the quality of the data you collect. When unsure, assume the worst alternative. The big picture matters more than the details. And carbon accounting is a learning process. And then with regards to baseline and target setting, we have two guidelines. A target requires a specific scope and baseline. Compare apples with apples. Thank you for watching this video. We hope you enjoyed it and learned some good content for getting started with your first round of carbon accounting.